Hi, hello, and welcome. It's me, Nella Fahidayat, and you are streaming Dear World Live. How do we uh, construct our economy in a way that is climate friendly? Education, I would like to argue, plays a hugely important role in leveling the playing field. How do we actually ensure women's inclusion? How do we ensure women's safety? Hello, hi, and welcome indeed. It's me, Nelifa. Welcome back to another episode of Dear World Live streaming to you wherever you are watching us right now. We are brought to you by Doha Debates. This season, we are exploring all our topics through the lens of bridging divides, and today is no different. We are marking World Press Freedom Day. We're talking about the gap between those in power and those often holding them to account the press. I've been a journalist and a filmmaker for over 12 years, traveling around the world. I've seen firsthand the dedication, persistence and resilience of journalists in every country trying to get the news out there in the best ways possible. In a moment, I am honored to be joined by some of those journalists. Khalid Helmi is a Syrian journalist and Maria salazar Ferro uh, will be joining us from the Committee to Protect Journalists. But first, let's set the stage uh, in terms of the discussion we're about to have. From the largest global broadcaster to the smallest local newspaper, a free press is valuable to us all. And it is important, isn't it? Accurate information is what helps all of us make informed choices as individuals and as a society. Freely sharing it is how we celebrate our heroes, expose our villains and keep our leaders in check. But the 2021 World Press Freedom Index shows that journalism is restricted or even totally banned in 73% of the 180 countries ranked, 73%. The pandemic has made things worse. At a time when access to information is quite literally a matter of life and death, misinformation has spread across the world, sowing confusion, confusion and division. In fact, a global survey found that 59% of respondents in 28 countries felt journalists deliberately tried to mislead the public by reporting information they know to be false. This sentiment can mean journalists face restrictions, persecution, or worse. Let's take the case of Bahar Mohammed and his colleagues at Al Jazeera English. Back in 2013, whilst covering the Egyptian revolution, Bahar and his two colleagues, Mohammed Fahmi and Peter Grista, were accused by the Egyptian government of spreading false news. Bahar spent 437 days in jail, many of them in solitary confinement. When he was finally released in September 2015, he reached. Uh, he had a lot to say, and we reached out to him, in fact, to, to see what he made of all of this and what he thinks is at stake for all of us when the press is not free. The absence of press freedom in Egypt leads and led before to disasters, and sometimes it leads nations to fail. Look at the situation of Corona. Nobody knows what over the situation of the pandemic. Nobody knows the real numbers of what is going on in Egypt. People are dying in hospitals. Some governorate are like, they lost control over governorate. This is one thing. We don't know our situation about everything in Egypt. So people also don't have the right to choose. People are not choosing what do they, do they want. They don't know what is right, what is wrong. And if you try to express that, you're thrown into jail. So whether you are in jail, a terror, accused of being a terrorist, or you are on the side of the government, which is not, not, not right. The situation and the society is not healthy. Nobody, is, nobody has the right to say anything. Our deepest thanks to Bahar Mohammed there. Thank you so much for those comments. We will get into so much of what uh, he raised in those issues, but this is Dear World Live, and this show is nothing without your contribution. Your questions, your comments, your thoughts, your views on all of this are so important to us. Please get involved with the show. 
type in your comments and questions in the chat bar wherever you are tuning in from. We are at Doha Debates across all of our social channels. I cannot wait to hear from you. I'm so eager to get you into the show. Please send them in. But for now, why don't you just tell me where it is you are joining us from in the world? Okay, without any further ado, it's time to meet our guests for the show. Khaloud Halmi is an award-winning Syrian journalist and co-founder of Inar Baladi, a newspaper established at the beginning of the Syrian war to counter the propaganda and the disinformation of the Assad regime. Maria Salazar Ferro is the writer and current director of the Emergencies Department at the Committee to Protect Journalists. She works to help journalists in troubled areas around the world and help to keep them safe. And as ever, we are joined by a wonderful student audience member. This week is Maureen Bulu, a Tanzanian American student who uses TikTok to share news about the African continent to her over 200,000 followers, including me. Thank you all for joining us today. Khaloud, I wanna start with you. You have worked in Syria. You, you, your journalism is so important out there. But why did you feel the need to set up a newspaper in Al Baladi back in 2011? What need were you serving then? Okay, uh, thank you very much. And I'm glad to be here with you. So back in 2011 and still up till this moment, the media in Syria is a state owned media and the regime and its um, intelligence forces control everything that goes in TV or like on TV, radio and newspapers. So when the, uh, when the peaceful demonstration started at the beginning of, no, mid-March 2011, uh, people were not knowing what's going on. Large numbers of people demonstrated in the streets calling for democracy, freedom of, of rights and, and they were calling for freedom of expression, human rights, and so on. But they were immediately, um, they were faced by force uh, from the Syrian regime, the intelligence forces, and the army. So back then, there was no one uh, covering what's going on. The but international. Why you? But why you? Why did you decide to do this in a time when you were met with yeah. violence, with aggression, with with so much? I want to know, Khaloud, why you? Why did you pick up that baton? Yeah, I'm going there. So <laughs> at that time, international journalists were not allowed to come in the country. They were not granted visas. And the Syrian journalists were mostly uh, working with, in, I mean, in the state-owned media platforms. So no one was daring to say anything. And at that time, I found myself, I speak English, I have access, and uh, my Arabic is good. So why not we have our own platform and tell the people what's going on, especially I was an eyewitness and I was a peaceful demonstrator myself. And my friends were facing violence and most of them were detained even at the very early days or days and stages of the Syrian revolution. And that's why. So after you set up Enar Baladi, um, you and your colleagues, I think we have a photo that we want to show here at this point. There they are. You and your wonderful colleagues, you suffered tremendously. Uh, why did you want us to, to show this picture to our audience? What does this picture mean to you and, and who are they? Can you pick out a few people for us? Yeah. Okay. Um, so it means a lot for me because this is our very first gathering after um so we've never been able to gather like this i mean in in person since we started the newspaper in 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 december 2011 so prior to december 2011 we were sharing peaceful demonstrations but because we were not able to meet in one place so we couldn't meet all together in one place and that was our very first trainings in December 2012 uh, where we we got the chance to go and get some training by um, Enter News UK and uh, they were the first people to train us on um, the, the basics of journalism because we were not journalists. Why this, it's this is what's so great. It, it, uh, I'm intrigued to know you, I just think it's remarkable. Most of us as a journalist, myself, we, we choose this path. 
you had to work so hard, not only to get the news out, but to learn to be a journalist. And that photo there is a, a, a group of you who chose to do this in, in the face of such difficulties. Um, let's put that picture up again. Tell me a little bit about some of these people. Where are you guys now? Okay. So in a nutshell, um, all of us are in exile now. Um, the lady uh, with the big hair to the to the right is not with us. She was one of the trainers. Uh, Ahmed, who is standing to the right with the like a beige uh, sweatshirt, he was killed by the Syrian regime. He was our first managing uh, uh, managing editor. We lost him in Daria, literally almost immediately after this this photo, like we lost him two months later. And he was a great man of a great aspiration. He, he had a master's degree in economics and he dreamt of a better Syria that could join all of us, but we lost him. Prior to be killed by the regime, he was detained for two times by the Assad regime and he was tortured. But I don't know, thankfully, he was released to be killed. The guy next to him, he is in exile. I am not going to mention where he is now. The the lady covering her face, not to be caught by the regime because she was meant to go back to, to Syria. She was detained by the regime with her sister, who was not with the picture, and they remained in jail for 10 months. And then she was released. Shall I continue? I Khalid, I, I yeah. just, it's overwhelming. And I'm sure those people who are streaming Dear World Live right now on World Press Freedom Day feel the pain, but also are just inspired by your words and your dedication. I'm going to come back to you because I have so much more to learn and to ask from you. But I want to bring in Maria at this point. Maria, you work to try and protect people like Khalid, like her colleagues, who are at the front line between truth, lies, and power all over the world. Tell us about the work that you do at the CPJ um, to try and keep journalists as safe as possible and, and the challenges you meet. Thank you so much for having me. I want to start by saying how honored I am to be here with Halud and, um, you know, to be uh, participating in something with someone so, so brave. Um, so the Committee to Protect Journalists is mostly a, a research and advocacy organization. Since we were founded, we've used the tools of journalism to defend journalists around the world. So we report and publicize violations, attacks, um, any kind of really attack on press freedom. Uh, but actually, since uh, since the Syrian war mostly, and since the 2014 killings uh, of two freelance two American freelancers in Syria, we realized how much the world was changing and how the landscape for working journalists had changed. So we created the emergencies team that I lead, and what we do is um, we uh, we have tools to prevent. Uh, to preventative tools. So we train journalists to stay safe. Uh, we train journalists like Halud and we work with journalists who, uh, who like you have had training and more experience um, on, on safety techniques. And um, when journalists get in trouble, when uh, teams of journalists get in trouble, we step in and we give them support, whether that is, again, more information or um, emergency support to help them leave the, their country, leave the city where they're working, find doctors, find uh, lawyers, um, whatever they may need to get back on their feet and continue to work. Maria, what do you think is at stake? We've spoken about the journalists and the risk they take. What do you think is at stake for ordinary people if those in power succeed in silencing and restricting and suppressing the free press? I mean, I think without a free press and without freedom of information, without having access to information, I think everything's at stake. I, I honestly think this is one of our most basic human rights without access to information on how to stay safe. And right now that's crucial, how to stay safe during a pandemic, access on where to find food um, or access on how to make political choices. Um, we, we have no access to freedom. We have no access to human rights. So. By attacking journalists, they're they're attacking, you know, those in power are attacking uh, all of us and really making it very hard to live our day to day lives. 
A very quick reminder to those of you who are watching us right now, this is Dear World Live. Today, we are looking at the freedom of the press and how important it is to me, to my guests, and to you. We are at Doha Debates across all of our social media channels. Drop us a question and a comment on everything you've heard so far from Maria, from uh, Khaloud as well. Have you experienced any of the issues that have been raised so far where you're from? Uh, just a quick running through of the people who are watching the show right now. I want to say a quick hello to Nawal, who is watching us from Qatar, from Doha. Mumin and Trisha, both watching from India. Hello to you. Thank you for joining us. And Suzanne Meyer is in Switzerland. Uh, give me a quick type out of any questions and comments in the chat function wherever you're watching. Remember, this show is nothing without you. I always want to know uh, what you guys think of the issues that we are covering. Let's now turn to our audience member. This week, we are joined by Marie Mbulu, a TikToker sharing news about the African continent with her followers, including me. I'm a massive fan. Here's a snippet of her TikTok. Hey, here are all the good things going on in Africa today. Mauritius is on its way towards eliminating poverty in its country. As a part of the country's Marshall Plan against poverty, citizens living in absolute poverty will receive cash transfers. They will also have a social worker that will help them with life challenges such as childcare, education, rehab, and housing. So just a quick one. Why did you start, Marie? Why did you start this channel? There's lots of journalists out there covering the stories in Africa, aren't there? Yeah, there are. And I found that most of the news that people receive about Africa always has to do with war, tragedy, or suffering. And um, Africans don't even know what's going on in their neighboring countries. So I felt like there is a need to talk about current events, historical events, and just innovations going on in Africa so that when people think of Africa and what's going on, they don't automatically think of suffering. I'd like to raise my hand as one of those people that only sees the, the continent of Africa, the continent of Africa through the very narrow lens of sort of Western, uh, maybe a, a very narrow lens of Western journalism. And this is where you come in with Harari and Gemma. You try to broaden that perspective. Just one more question for you. Why TikTok? Why have you chosen to use that as a platform? Yeah, I felt like, um there wasn't a voice for like a young African on current events and uh, young Africans are on TikTok. So I felt like it would be just great to connect to people who would understand my perspective and uh, for people just to gain a new perspective like of a young person. Beautiful. Let's get all of my guests up if we can. I'd like to have all of my wonderful, uh, there you all are, beautiful. Uh, Marie, do you have a question that you would like to ask Maria and Khalud at this point? Yeah, I do. Um, where do you see people getting their news from developing? So let's come to you first, Maria. Where do you see people getting their news? Uh, I mean, Marie herself is on TikTok. We have loads of different platforms. Where do you see that changing and moving forward? I mean, social media is really where, where it's at, I think. Uh, I think it depends what country you are in. Some countries, Twitter is really popular. Some countries, Facebook is really popular. Obviously, TikTok. Um, but social media is where people are getting a lot of their news. And I think that is both really encouraging because uh, it opens up uh, access to news, to information to a lot of people. But I, it also requires a lot of news literacy. And I know that that's something we probably are going to talk about today. Uh, but knowing where you're getting your news and checking on, on those news is really important to accessing them through social media. Oh, you have read my script there, Maria, clearly, because uh -huh. you know exactly what we're talking about next. Khalud, I'd like to come to you with Marie's question or uh, about this idea of the development of news, because you have worked very hard to capitalize on the digital uh, evolution of, of news and, and how we consume journalism. Khalud. Thank you. So as Mary, Maria has mentioned, I think people get their news from social media, which is heavily present in the lives of everyone. Now access to phones and mobile phones is super easy. There's no need to turn on a TV and watch a, 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 like a news channel if you are not interested. And people are getting less and less interested in, in getting a newspaper, reading it. And this is unfortunately I say, but social media is the medium and the platform for almost everyone to get their news from. And long may it continue. Very interesting points raised there. Thank you to my guests. I want to focus our conversation a little bit more on this idea of disinformation, if I can. I'd like to hear from all of you um, about how you have encountered disinformation and what you feel 
that it's cost journalists and the citizens that consume that news and maybe how it's benefited. Maria, if I can come to you first, perhaps, could you start off by telling us just a brief description of what disinformation is when it comes to news? Maria. Well, it's actually a hearty debate that I've had with with my team, the team that's that's working on safety to journalist. What is disinformation and what is misinformation? So, this is by no means and and you know an an encyclopedia answer. This is what we've come to a conclusion as a team. And disinformation, we think, is the active uh, engagement in giving false information. Uh, with a purpose, often a purpose of changing the, you know, the course of events. Um, we, my team has also been very, very heavily involved in the U.S. over the last year or so for, for obvious reasons. You know, a lot of protests, a lot of political turmoil that um, had very interesting impact on journalism here. And we've focused a lot of, on disinformation here in the U.S. Um, so some of the disinformation we've seen obviously is around uh, the election that was that was very big and how the election could have been tipped changed but we've also seen a lot of disinformation around the pandemic around covid-19 and disinformation around vaccines around uh, you know how much it's spreading that's that sort of thing now to go back to journalists um, disinformation is also being used um, not only in the US, around the world to attack journalists and either, mm. you know, to discredit them, certainly mm. to discredit the news that they're reporting, but also disinformation on journalists, um, uh, for example, on their private lives, uh, you know, on, on things that they've said that they've done. Yes. And, and, and I mean, I, I always turn to the example of um, CNN uh, correspondent uh, Jim Acosta, who during the, the time of uh, former President Donald Trump was referred to as an enemy of the people. When journalism is put on trial in this way and journalists who have reputations and experiences are called the enemy of the people, truth, facts, and reality itself becomes warped. Khaluda, I want to come to you. You set up a newspaper because of the disinformation campaign. And in fact, if I tune into uh, news coming out of Syria from state-owned media, everything is fine and brilliant. All the places look wonderful. The people are happy. How do you feel when you're constantly battling this barrage of, of disinformation? Yeah, so it's first of all it's so tiring and it's it's consuming so you feel yourself most of the time we reach a level where we feel that what we are doing and what we are reporting um i mean first of all we've lost our dear people um i mean they're dead or they are in detention centers um uh, myself and my family we are displaced we, we we were idps first and now we are refugees outside the country in a foreign country that we don't know the language, the culture, and we've struggled. We started from scratch. But why we continue? Why you go on? But for a second, you say, like, no, I continue for those oppressed, for those who are still in prison, for those whom we are fighting for, for their freedom and for, for a future Syria that I really dream that we have freedom of expression. So why... We feel the disinformation campaign is not coming from the Syrian regime itself only. We have Russia, a great support to the regime where massive disinformation campaigns come from the Russian side. We've also other partners, other parties, um, including the Iranian government and China sometimes. So yes, we have them, but mainly Russian. Uh, we found ourselves we're not only fighting the disinformation coming from the Syrian regime, but also from other uh, more powerful, more, uh, let's say, like p p platforms that they have the money and the manpower to, uh, to, to benefit and to fight our sources of information. Unfortunately, we started to see that they are manipulating our own memories as well. Now the Syrian regime, they are making films, uh, TV series about what happened in the past, but they claim them from their own perspective. And this is so frustrating and we're still alive, we're not dead. So we still have the story in our hearts, but it's dis like it's distorted in front of our eyes. So you let alone that intent. Believe what yeah. you're seeing even. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Khalou, thank you for sharing that. 
Marie, how do you feel as a citizen journalist, as, as somebody who does this for the love of it, hearing from Khalud speak in that way and hearing from Maria? I just want to get a sense of what, how you feel hearing all of this. Yeah, um, I can relate a lot, especially with the frustration and um, it, it actually like pushing back off of Maria. It, election season has come up in Africa. There's been so a multitude of elections. And just by me reporting what's going on, who's winning, um, like the candidates, that it would be people who are from the countries in the country. And you can see how the governments like mislead the people, lie to the people. And you can put, you know, 6,000 sources, 6,000 videos saying, no, this is what happened. This is the truth about this leader. And, um, and they'll just simply, they refuse to believe like the truth or like of, um, of what, what's happening like in their own country. So it, it can get very frustrating and um, just very difficult like to constantly, constantly, um, Try to like but press it, about what's the truth. But this is why Marie, Maria, Hood, this is why you are so important to the fabric of journalism in 2021. You guys have been tuning into Dear World Live this Press Freedom Day from all over the place. Those of you who are watching us on YouTube from Washington, DC in the US, from Lahore in Pakistan, from Mexico and Kazakhstan. You are very welcome here. Um, I want to get through some of the comments and the questions that you guys have been sending in. Um, this week, actually, uh, this week we've got students who are watching from Northwestern University in Qatar. We have some great comments and questions from them. Let me read a few of those out. So, uh, Momen Ghanim says, we need to work more on digital journalism to utilize digital tools to reduce the number of reports. Uh, work, reporters working in harsh conditions. Inara Ganji thinks that the role of journalism and the press needs to be redefined. I wonder what they mean by that. And Joyang Chow uh, says, points out that user-generated content is significantly rising, even in professional news media, and wants to know what are the pros and cons, cons of that. And lots more comments from people at NUQ. Thank you to Abdul Rahman, Ifra Abed, Mohammed Abdullah. Sorry, we couldn't get to all of them. You guys are very thoughtful and there's just too many to get through. Uh, but just one more that I want to read out. Um, so this one's from Miriam Abdullah Albad. Uh, and uh, Maria, Miriam believes that freedom of speech is often considered a Western concept. How do we decolonize it and apply it to the Arab world specifically. I want to come to you first, Khalud. Is freedom of sp speech a Western concept? What do we mean when we say that we want to decolonize it? Is that something that you agree to? Uh, yes and no. It needs to be decolonized because, I mean, um, even sometimes in, in the West, you can't see it's, uh, I mean, yes, there is freedom of, of speech, and freedom of the press, but sometimes it's maneuvered or manipulated by um, big money, um, big politicians, let's say. It happened when Trump was uh, was uh, in his ra racing for, uh, uh, for presidency and when he was a president as well. So it's not pure um, South. So yes, we are cursed. Uh, if you may allow me to use this word by by people who are ruling us by the oppression that we have to cope with but yes i mean the the west also suffers from this but not as much as we are it need to be um, more human it needs to go back to the people themselves we need to give people their say and let them decide what they want but give the people their say maria what about you what do you think well, let me start by just pointing out that Halud's story uh, shows that that it's it's it to me it's not only a Western concept. I mean, the, the the trials that Syrian journalists have gone through in the last ten years to make sure that the story of Syria is getting out shows the importance of of freedom of the press, of freedom of information to the world. Um, like Syrian journalists, I've seen Syrian sorry, I've seen journalists around the world working like crazy to do the same thing, you know, going into extreme situations to make sure that a story is reported, to make sure that the story gets out. Um, and in that way, I think you, you can't just think of it as a, as a Western concept. It's really a global concept. As a person myself, I grew up, I was born in Kabul. I grew up as a refugee until I was seven years old. And now I live 
in London, where I'm coming to you, where I'm doing the Dear World live show right now. For me, freedom of the press uh, and trusting the news media is sacrosanct. But I understand that there's a difference in understanding what freedoms mean uh, in some countries as opposed to others. So that's a really interesting question. But I want to come to you, Marie, with this one. Let's go back to the um, Jo Young Choi. Sorry for mispronouncing your name first time. Uh, jo Young Choi says that there's a lot more of user generated content that we have, and this is affecting journalism. What are the pros and cons? Um, what do you think, Marie? Is, is user generated content, is the content that normal citizen journalists make during the Arab Spring, during uh, Sudan's uh, elections, riots, and protests around the world, do you think these are important? Are they as valid as journalism uh, in other sh shapes and forms? Yeah, I, I do think it's important. I think that sometimes they catch information that um, may be missed by maybe like a bigger organization, for sure. Um, I definitely think maybe some cons to it are that user-generated content makes you more accessible to your audience than if you were talking to, like if you're talking through like a bigger organization. So sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes it's not as a good thing. Because um, you can be prone to uh, like harassment, um, you can be prone to people just think that you're more accessible and sometimes people like to use you as like the only source. Um, and I think like that, that that you should use multiple, make multiple different users or multiple different organizations. Marie, you raise a really important point that I hadn't thought about before the show today. You don't have the backing of Doha debates in the way that I do. You don't have the backing of giant organizations like CNN and the BBC and Al Jazeera and all of this. You do this because you solely believe in it's good in the same way that Khalud did. I want to see Maria and Khalud, how you feel about the work that Marie's doing uh, by herself. Are you in Tanzania right now or the States, Marie? I'm in the States right now. But you were in Tanzania a few weeks ago, if I remember correctly. Yes, because I follow you avidly. What do you <laughs> make of this work that citizen journalists are doing? Let's get think first, Maria. Yeah, yes. no, I think it's I think it's crucial. I think, and again, uh, uh, I'm going to go back to, to the Arab Springs and to and to the Syrian war. I mean, um, that's where we really started to see it bubble up, and that's when we really started to see the importance of of uh, citizen journalists. Um, I, I do think you make a very important point in terms of safety, and that is that. Um, it's sort of a double-edged sword. It's crucial to get that information. It's crucial to get those different perspectives, especially in places where CNN and the BBC may not be. But the la the, the backing is also is also, or the lack of backing is also really it's 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 important to to know it, especially when it comes to safety and safety in all of its components, right? Not just in terms of having. Uh, uh, a helmet and a flak jacket, but in terms of preparing, thinking about risk, thinking about digital risk, thinking about um, any kind of psychological implications that a story may have, or you know, legal co consequences. Yeah. Absolutely, Khalid, you're nodding there very vigorously. I want to come to yeah. you briefly. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, in a nutshell, uh, the as Maria has mentioned, citizen journalists were the ones who were leading all the. Uh, they were the source of information in Syria and in the Arab Spring in other countries. So yes, they play a great and major role in 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 telling the stories of their countries, where major uh, media platforms cannot be there or they don't know what is going there at the spur of the moment, where they give themselves not they give themselves they take themselves the space and tell their stories to the world. Thank you very much to my guests. As you know, this season of Dear World Live, we are focusing on how we can overcome divisions. And today we want your advice on how we can begin to restore trust in the media. So before I ask my next question, I just want to thank everyone who's made comments uh, and suggestions wherever you're watching Dear World Live from. Thank you for tuning in. Now, my dear guests, my wonderful uh, uh, journalists here, you are doing the phenomenal job of getting the truth out as journalists. but what advice do you have that you want to give to the audience of your content to help them become smarter news consumers? Khalid, you first. Okay, do not believe everything you read. <laughs> this is the first thing. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, let's yeah. move on to Maria. <laughs> Sorry, it was just, she's just like, don't believe everything you hear. Very good point. Maria, you next. 
we all nodded, so we're all with Khalud. Um, I think uh, it's really important to check, uh, you know, after you, you question what you read, check the source of what you're reading, you know, check who the reporter is, what else that person has reported on, check on the news source. You know, is it a reputable news source? Is it, uh, you know, uh, the, Again, what other stories have they look, uh, looked at? Look at other similar stories in other um, sources to make sure that what you're reading is that to contextualize what you're reading, if you will. And I have, for the first time ever on Dear World Live, my own bit of hot news um, and tip and advice for those of you who are watching. The best thing you can do is to make sure that you are not consuming news that you agree with. Read papers, go on websites, Click on people on TikTok who you disagree with to see what other people are saying. This doesn't mean that one is true and one is a lie, but it just gets you a better context of what the conversation is around. Marie, I can see you nodding your head. Are you going to be taking any of these advice, this, these tips that we've been giving back to you, to your daily life in Tanzania and, and the US and your work, in fact? Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Most definitely considering the source because I, I found it was very easy, especially news related to... Um, like elections just in general in Africa, once I'd read the article and be like, oh, okay. But then I look at the source and find like, you know, this is government owned. Um, they only post about this certain uh, perspective. Um, and it really made me like really think about my sources. Thank you so much. We're running out of time. We've absolutely blitzed through this episode of Dear World Life. I would like to thank my phenomenal guests. Uh, and if you want to support them and their amazing organizations, we're dropping their social handles into the comment section wherever you are watching right now. So head over there, subscribe, follow, support their work. It's important. You love it, don't you? Thank you to Khalud Helmi. Wave goodbye, my wonderful guests, to Maria Salazar Ferro and to Marie Mbulu. You have been wonderful. It's been a pleasure to have you on Dear World Live today. Thank you. Now, Dear World Live may be taking a tiny weenie break, but the conversation does not stop. There's plenty. I mean, seriously, there's so much more content for you at Doha Debates, including our totally amazing, splendiferous, brilliant, great podcast, Course Correction where we focus on free speech, on disinformation, and so much more. Take a listen. There should be freedom of words. Should be. It's up to people to investigate the words. It's up to people to understand who is the liar and who tells the truth. That's just a tiny snippet, a, a, a modicum of what's waiting for you. Uh, get your amazing course correction podcast subscription wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, um, Stitcher, wherever it is. You want to subscribe. A new episode drops every Wednesday. I host it. And there's a lot that you will learn um, and a lot of difficult conversations that we have that I just learned so much from and you will too. And we're not done there because we've got lots more digital content for you over at our website, dohadebates.com, including our web series, Better Conversations. It's the place to learn how to have tough conversations with people you do not agree with. Trust me, I'm serious here. I learned a lot from it. Um, oh, just news hot off the press. It's up for an award. It's up for a Webby Award, guys. Please vote for us by visiting our website, and following the link there, make sure that you tune into Better Conversations, learn from it, and then go vote for the Webbies. We want to win. We hope you can help us win. That is it from me and my wonderful team at Dear World Live. I hope you've enjoyed the stream so far. I can't wait to see you soon. Goodbye. <laughs>